Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Really hope that you uh, enjoyed the throwback uh, for a few minutes. We just wanted to remind everybody um, really who we are. And sometimes that does not come across uh, over the internet. If you have a copy of the Word of God, I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. One of the best friends that I've ever had in my life was the gospel singer Tony Green. Uh, only a few days before Tony passed, he called me on the phone and he said, Pastor, what was that passage of scripture that you preached on recently? You know, uh, the one uh, that you talked about, our eyes on Jesus. And, and I had the opportunity to share with him uh, that it was Second Chronicles in chapter number 20. One of, the, one of the big things that I'm hearing right now, probably more than anything else coming my way, is people are really overwhelmed. Have, have really never faced anything like what we are facing right now and uh, find it very difficult to navigate. And you put what we're going through with the uh, COVID-19 along with everything else that people are going through and it's easily... Uh, understood uh, why people can get overwhelmed. You may be one of those people that you have so much coming your way that it's simply hard to keep up uh, with everything. I, I think we just have too much stuff now. We have too much news. We have too much social media. We have too many emails and text messages and we're being bombarded by every imaginable thing. I, I even went to the grocery store the other day to buy some groceries and I got down uh, in the aisle that sells rice and we were trying to buy some rice for dinner. And uh, lo and behold, there were about 50,000 boxes of different kinds of rice and I'm looking and, and searching and trying to, which one of these do I choose? And we just have too much stuff coming our way. Some of you are facing too much debt and you're trying to figure out how in the world am I going to get out of this hole that I have dug myself in. Some of you are facing the loss of a job and your work life is putting tremendous amount of pressure on you. Some of you are faced with an overwhelming situation that you are worried about. Uh, I'm watching people uh, in, in, in this uh, process of just settling down and, and settling in place, facing major problems with loneliness. And maybe you're facing too much resentment and, and you don't know how to deal with that resentment and you've been holding on to something for so long that now it's overwhelmed you. Some of you are facing some things in your marriage relationship that you don't know how to deal with that and you're about to fly the coop because you're sensing that you are overwhelmed. What, what are you gonna do when you face situations in life that overwhelm you. So I want us to look at one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter number uh, 20. And we're gonna come across an old boy that has a strange name. His name is Jehoshaphat. Isn't that a weird name? Can you imagine naming one of your kids Jehoshaphat? How, how many of you have a nickname that people call you by? Can you imagine what kind of nickname that Jehoshaphat would have. Hey, J-Fat, how you doing, man? Hey, Fatty, come on over here. And, and, and he was a decent kind of guy, though. He was a good leader, as a matter of fact, in his nation. If you look back to chapter 19, you discover that uh, as the leader of the nation of Israel, he led Israel into a spiritual renewal. But some things began to change dramatically after that in chapter number 20. Since so, so this leads me to just share a word with you. You really have to be careful after a major victory because you, you're going to rub some people wrong. And there's some people that are not going to like what happened with you and because of you and they're going to come at you. Uh, after every major victory, watch out. Something's about to happen. All right, let's pick it up 
in verse 1, if you will. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab, the Moabites, and the children of Ammon, the Ammonites, uh, with him other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria, and behold, they be in uh, Hazazon Tamar, which is in, in Gedi. That's a huge issue here. Three nations coming against one nation. Have you ever had a day like that? When you felt like that life had just tagged team view like the WWF? Uh, that, that somebody was about to body slam you and you had too many fronts and it seemed like it just came on you suddenly and without warning and it was overwhelming to you? Well, can you imagine how Jehoshaphat must have felt this day when he got the news that three nations overwhelming his one nation. Now watch verse three because there's a great lesson here. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea. So here's the lesson uh, that we can learn real quick uh, in this passage. And, and that is the importance of prayer when you feel like that you're being overwhelmed. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you have all of that coming against you, it really ought to make, motivate you to pray more than you have ever prayed in your life. Now, in this prayer of Jehoshaphat, he did five things uh, that I want to call your attention to so that when you are overwhelmed, and by the way, let me just say this. If you're not overwhelmed right now, hang on, you're going to be before you get out of this life. Some of you just came from that kind of an experience. Some of you are in that kind of experience. And then some of you are headed toward that kind of experience. And I want you to write these down because you may not need them right now, but you will before too much longer. So let's look at these five things. The first thing that I want you to see with me tonight is that you've got to go to the right place first. Go to the right source first. Normally, when we get overwhelmed, normally when we have stuff coming against us, one of the first things that we want to do is we want to start planning and scheming and trying to figure out how am I going to be able to handle such a thing as I am facing. And we will put off prayer until it's a last resort rather than the first response. I've had people say things to me like this. Well, pastor, I guess all we can do now is pray. Well, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with seeking God first. So here's old uh, Jehoshaphat, and he says, you know, uh, you know, God, I'm about to get my tail kicked here, and, and there are three nations that are coming against me, and frankly, I don't know what to do about it. And maybe you've got some of that going on in your own life. Maybe it be marital, it could be financial, it could be health, uh, it could be family situations that are coming against you. And one of the things that we immediately see here in this passage is just cry out to God. God, I need help. So you want to go to the right source first. Watch this in verse 4. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Isn't that wonderful leadership? It's the kind of leadership that we need in America today that would go before the nation and unashamedly Say, God, we're in a mess, and we really don't know what to do about it, and God, we need your help. We need to lay our egos and our logos to the side and simply say to the nation of America today, let's pray. Unlike a governor of New York who yesterday, which would be, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this... Uh, uh, now, but uh, a couple of days ago, he, uh, he, he proclaimed that uh, the numbers had gone down and God didn't have anything to do with it. 
What kind of leadership is that? We need men of God that would call this nation to get on our faces before God and to seek him during this time. Now, let me just say to you, you're overwhelmed and you think, well, it's just a small problem. Do you know that there's no problem too small that you ought not to pray about? And if a problem is small enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. There's no problem too big that you can't pray about. If you have a big, big problem that is causing you to worry, you ought to take it to God. Just look today at uh, what God is doing here in this passage and how Jehoshaphat prays and just do the same thing uh, that he's doing. And, and, and if you're under an attack, I want you just to go to God and do exactly what Jehoshaphat did. He asked three questions uh, here in this passage. He said, are you not? And he said, did you not? And then he asked the third question, will you not? Now, if you will brand this in your mind and brand this in your heart, write it down as we go through the passage, it will help you greatly in facing the giants uh, that are in your life. So you want to go to the right source first. Second, you want to get the right perspective. You want to get the right perspective. And, and that means Jehoshaphat said, I'm not going to get my eyes on the problems. I'm going to stay focused in on God. And so we're going to look at these three questions. And he said, are you not? Did you not? Will you not? And so he was focusing in on God and not the problems that he was facing in his life. He had an entirely different perspective. And when you were focused in on problems, on, on problems like how am I going to do with this debt? How am I going to get uh, uh, situated in this marriage? How am I going to deal with this loneliness? How am I going to find this job? And you're so focused in on that, those problems just grow and grow and grow. But when you get a perspective on how big, oh, here, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. But, but when you get a perspective on how big God is, then the problems begin to diminish and they look much smaller than they really are. Now, notice there's some elements about this prayer. Three things that I want to show you. All right, verse number six. I want you to see that he remembered how big God was. Watch it now. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Let, let, let me just say to you, Jehoshaphat, he got a good picture of who God is. And he realized, you know, God, you're, you're creator God. You're bigger than any problem that I'm ever going to face in my life. And ladies and gentlemen, that same thing is true just for you. And in your situation, right where you are, right what you're facing, may I say to you, God is much bigger than anything that you'll ever encounter. So you got to get the right perspective. Get your eyes off of the problems and see how big God is. Now, the second thing is that he remembered what God had done for him. Watch this, if you will, in verse 7. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel and gave it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? He's reminding God about, by the way, you can just kind of sense his growing confidence as he is praying. He said, now God, I remember how that you took Abraham and you brought him to the promised land and then you allowed them to go down to Egypt for a while and how that Moses then by the direction of your hand, he led them back to the promised land. And God, I knew that you did all of that. You took care of them and I know that because you took care of them that you're gonna take care of me too. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, this is not the first time that you've been overwhelmed. This is not the first time that you faced mountains of difficulties. And the same God who delivered you then is the same God that is going to deliver you now. Now, the third thing is that he remembered what God had promised. Did you see the latter part of verse 7? He said, 
Now, God, let me remind you that you promised that that land would be to them forever. Can I just say to you the third thing about praying is that uh, you need to be a promise person. You need to nail down the promises of God. Somebody counted, I didn't do it, but somebody counted and said that there are like 7,000 promises contained in the word of God. And what you ought to do really is that you ought to search out those promises, put them on a three by five card, write them out, hold on to them, memorize them so that when you get to those times in your life that you are overwhelmed, you can just go back and say, now God, you promised this. And God, you promised that. And when you are, listen, if you're going to be a man of faith, if you're going to be a woman of faith, you're going to have to be a promise person. You're going to have to know what God has said. Now, let me give you number three. You ready for this one? You go to the right source first. You seek God out in prayer, all right? And the the third thing is that you admit that you are powerless to do anything about your situation. That's imperative. It's so very important. Watch this in verse 12. Uh, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. I want to ask you a question. Just think with me through this for a minute. Have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever felt helpless? Have you ever felt that you were just not able? Maybe, I don't know why this has been kind of pervasive this week in my mind, but this thing of debt. Have you ever let debt overcome you to the point that you felt like there's no way in the world I'm ever going to be able to get out of this. Have you ever been in a relationship that you felt trapped in, that you felt like that was going nowhere, that was impossible situation for you? Have you ever come to the place that you just admitted that there was nothing that you could ever do about it? That's the place you want to get to. A whole nation has been called out before God and they are standing together as a nation and they are praying to God and they simply said, God, we're powerless to do anything about what's happened here, but our eyes are upon you. Let let me encourage you. Just tell God how you feel. He already knows how you feel, but he wants you to come to the place in your life that you understand that you are powerless to do anything about your plight. When things look hopeless, just get to the point that you just spill your guts before God and just simply say, God, I can't do anything about my situation, but God, I want you to know that I am trusting you in the midst of this for everything. Now, so what happens when you are overwhelmed and you quit focusing in on the problem, and you begin to focus in on God instead, and you acknowledge before God, God, here's what you've done for me in the past in my life, and God, here are those promises that you have made to me about my present and about my future, and I am powerless to do anything about it, but I know deep down in my heart that I can trust you, and my eyes now are upon you. What can you expect? Well, let's look for a minute at God's proposal. God goes to Jehoshaphat and he goes to the nation of Israel and he says, relax, chill out. I got this. This is my battle, not yours. Powerful words. Watch this in verse 15. And he said, hearken all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, And thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Mm. 
Uh, you know the reason so many people get overwhelmed? Uh, the reason that so many people get discouraged and down, hopeless and helpless, is because they're trying to fight these battles in their own energy and in their own strength that God never intended for us to do. You see, the battle was not yours to begin with. The battle is God's. And you're living your life. Listen, listen. You are living your life as if victory is left up to you. And it's not. God isn't saying to the nation of Israel, nor is he saying it to us, I expect you guys to do the fighting. I don't expect that. I just want you to trust me. That's what God is saying. I, I wonder how many of you are like me. I, I'm, I'm listen. When I got one finger out that way, I, there are four more that are pointing back. H how many of you are fix-it people? Raise your hand. I, I, I'm one of those people. Uh, there, there's a problem arises, I think I can just fix it. I, I think I can fix anything that's coming and going. And, I, and, and the reason we think that is because uh, we think that if we can fix it, then we can control it. But the fact of the matter is you cannot fix it. And you cannot control it. You can't fix somebody else. Matter of fact, you can't even fix yourself, much less somebody else. And if you're one of these fix-it people that keep expending energy out there trying to fix situations, circumstances, and other people, you're inevitably going to fail. And then you go running back to God and you say, oh God, I have let you down so miserably. No, no. You haven't let God down because you weren't holding God up. There's a big difference. You, you understand these battles that we're facing, they're not our battles to start with. God says it's my battle. Now, I love going to Portland to check on our church planners. We have about 19 church planners uh, that we support in Portland, Oregon, and about twice a year, uh, I like to fly up there to check on them. And uh, th there's oftentimes a nonstop flight out of Charlotte uh, into PDX in, in, in Portland. Now, now, wouldn't it be a strange thing if your pastor uh, sitting there in his seat and we're getting ready to take off, we're, we're approaching uh, the, the, the place where the, the, the plane runs down the runway, and, and so here I stand up in the aisle and I start flapping my arms like this right here. And, and I'm just flapping, flapping, flapping my arms. And the flight attendant comes over to me and, and she says, sir, what in the world are you doing? And, and well, we're fixing to take off and, and, and I'm, I'm just trying to help my pilot out here. I, I wanna help this plane get off the ground. And she says to me, sir, uh, this plane has plenty of thrust to get us off the ground and to fly us uh, to, to Portland. So we don't need your help. Now I, could, I can keep this up maybe for about 45 minutes. And yet, uh, I'm amazed that when I sit down after that 45 minutes and I quit flapping my arms, that that plane never crashed when I quit flapping my arms, but it flew safely into Portland. Now, there's a couple of things you need to understand about flapping your arms. You look silly, and you also look frantic. And in the name of Jesus... When, when, when you're faced with an overwhelming situation, quit flapping. God doesn't need your help. We get to the point, a lot of times people just go to God and they say, oh God, you know, I just don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do this. I, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to stand this. And I'm on the verge of just giving up. Do you know what God says? Well, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad you finally got to that point. Now maybe we can see something get done. When we get out of the way, God says in verse 17, watch this. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord will be with you. Now I want you to notice something with me. 
Notice that they worshiped and they didn't worry. You see, you can pray and you don't have to panic. You can worry or you can worship. God says, uh, you don't need to fight. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to move. So just stand still. Do you know that sometimes it takes more courage to do nothing than it is to do something? God says, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to stand still. I don't want you to move. You know, now imagine what's going on here. There are three national armies that are coming against Israel. They are well armed and they are fully equipped. They got swords and spears and they got armor and they got uh, all kinds of chariots and horses and, and, and all kinds of, of the latest modern equipment to come against lowly Israel. And God says to them, don't do anything about this. I don't want you to run. I don't want you to fight. I want you to stand still. Are, are you going through a battle in your life today? Are you overwhelmed? Maybe God is saying to you, you, you're in the middle of a horrible relationship and you're about ready to fly the coop. Maybe your marriage is so stressful and out of sort that you're getting ready to pack your bags and you're getting ready to move. Do, do, you know what God's maybe saying to some of you? Don't you run. Quit your fighting. Stand still. I got this. Relax. Two times in this passage he says, don't worry, don't be afraid. Do you know why he's saying that? Because ladies and gentlemen, I've read the last chapter in the book and we win. We're victorious. The battle is the Lord's. Look at verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Do you, do, you know what, do, you, do you know what I see here in this passage that I believe will help you more than anything that you will ever be able to hear or do? He's saying to the nation of Israel, trust God and trust his prophets. What's he talking about these prophets? He's talking about the ones who have recorded the acts of God. Right here, he's talking about the word. So he's saying, trust God and trust his word. And if you want to see the battle won, come to the place that you trust him explicitly and completely. Let me give you number four. You got to advance in praise. Watch this in verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, watch this. this you know, I've talked to you about this before, uh, and maybe many of you remember it. Uh, but, but he says he appointed singers. He called a choir meeting. And he put the choir in place that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out, not with the army, but before the army. They went ahead of the army and to say, and here's the song that they were going to sing, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, can you imagine what the army must have thought when the choir was leading them into battle? Can you imagine what the choir must have thought when they were out front? But they had a word from God and he said, you know what? You're going to see the glory of God in the midst of this because this is my battle. Let, let me help you with your prayer life for just a minute. Uh, I, I don't know what you're facing, don't know the difficulties that you're going through right now. I, and I'm sure some of it is very severe. I know some of it's very severe because you and I have talked about many of those things and, and, and I've identified what some of you are facing. Um, you have to understand, this is not your battle. It's God's battle. And if I can help your prayer life, just go before God and tell him that you need help and that you pour out your heart to him. And then from that moment on, I want you to quit saying please. And I want you to begin to praise him for who he is. Praise him for the beauty of his holiness. Praise him in advance 
for what is going to happen. Praise him in advance for the deliverance that is going to come. Quit saying please and start saying thank you because God is going to give you the victory. Now let me hurriedly give you number five and we will close. I want you to discover the good that comes out of the problems. Now I about had a running spell uh, when I read this afresh and anew the other night. I don't know why I had never seen this point in this message ever before. I, I think it's really incredible. Look what happened in verse 24. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked into the multitude and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth and none escaped. In other words, this choir went out and they started singing and these three armies killed one another. And here comes the nation of Israel out there and they find all of these dead bodies lying everywhere. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels. Listen, listen which they stripped, stripped off for themselves more, <laughs> oh, more than they could carry away. And there were three days in gathering the spoil it was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Baraka. Remember that. The valley of Baraka. For there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place was called the valley of Baraka unto this day. Now, look what happens. When you let God fight your battles for you, you get blessed beyond measure. They went out there and they picked up gold and silver and precious jewels, so much so that one person, they, they couldn't carry it all and they had to share it with other people. Can, can I just say this as I close? Uh, this valley of Baraka, do you know what Baraka means? It means blessing. And it's called the valley of blessing even to today. And the word says that God would rather have you living in the valley of blessing than he had to, for you to live in the, in the valley of battles. That's a powerful truth. And, and so here's my, my word to you. Stop flapping your arms. Understand that this is God's battle for your life. Watch verse 27. Then they returned every man unto Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. Now watch this. For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. Do you understand? God won the battle. They didn't win the battle. God gave them the victory. They didn't earn it. They didn't deserve it. God gave it. They didn't have to fight for it. God fought the battle. It was given to them. What a great picture this is of the wonderful, marvelous grace of God. May I say to you, that's the same way you get into heaven. You don't battle for it. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. And the only way that you're ever going to get there <laughs> is God's going to give it to you by his grace and goodness and mercy. How many of you are in a battle right now and in a storm? Oh, friend, the battle is the Lord's. I want you to get to the place that you just say, you know what, God, uh, I take my hands off of this. And Lord, I recognize that I don't have what it takes to win the battle here. I realize that it's your battle. And, and God, I thank you in advance for fighting my battle for me. And then you just praise him in advance. Just give him glory for it and trust him. Trust him. Trust his word. Find the promise in the word of God that fits your situation and claim that promise before God. Now, some of you are watching this telecast today. 
that you don't have a clue what it means for God to do battle for you because you don't have a relationship with him. You, you've never had a time in your life that you really genuinely, earnestly turned away from sin and placed your faith in Jesus Christ and trusted him as your savior. And God has allowed you to see this television broadcast today, this internet broadcast, this Facebook telecast. He, he's privileged you to see this that God wants to fight your battles for you. But you've got to come to the place that you turn away from sin and you've got to place your faith and your trust in him. You say, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Well, if you would, right where you are, just bow your heads for a moment and let me share with you how you can have your sin forgiven, how you can have the Lord fight for you. Would you do that with me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you pray something like this with me? Would you just simply say, God, I'm overwhelmed today by my sin. I've tried to be a good person, but the harder I try, the more I see that it's futile. And God, today I come to the end of myself I know that I can't earn my way into heaven. And I know that it's my sin that keeps me from knowing you. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life right now. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you, Father, for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Amen. I want to welcome you. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want to welcome you to the family of God. You've done everything that the Bible teaches a person to do, to be saved, have your sin forgiven, go to heaven when you die. Now you're my brother. Now you're my sister in the Lord. We're part of the family of God. And I'd like to ask you to do something. Please don't turn uh, your computer off right now. Don't, don't turn the television off right now. I, I want you to do something for me. Uh, if you're watching by Facebook, if you're watching uh, by uh, the internet on our website, there, there's an opportunity right in front of you to click on that little section there on our website that says, I prayed to receive Christ as my Savior. Would you click on that? And I'd like to ask you, if you would, please... Give me the information. Give me your name and let me be able to pray for you and thank God for your salvation. I want to hear from you. I promise you this. I'm not going to put you on a mailing list. I'm not going to solicit any money from you. I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I, I just want to pray for you and possibly send you some material that would help you to become who God wants you to be. Thank you for watching this broadcast today. Thank you for listening as I brought the word of God. And I pray that you'll tell others about our program and invite your lost friends and neighbors so that they too could come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. God bless you as I pray. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.